ah, 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 ah. Remember ah, yesterday ah, when we did ah, Fermat's Little Theorem? And Fermat's Little Theorem was shh, 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 that a to the p mod p minus 1 was always, always 1. Uh, except, you know, A has to be co-prime with P. And looking at that equation, you might have noticed I was blinking back some tears when I saw that. Because that reminded me of when I was in primary school. <laughs> and the teacher said, we're going to, on an excursion now, and we're going to divide in little groups and do some scientific explanation, and we're going to keep a journal, and everyone's going to write an entry in the wiki. And uh, <laughs> everyone just form, get together with your friends, and form little groups of three. And I had lots of friends at that school. But you know what happened? It's like every kid's nightmare. What do you think happened? I was left over. Yeah, everyone, the, the class had like one more than a multiple of three people in it, and I was left. Because although I had lots of friends, they just somehow had better friends <laughs> with other people. <laughs> and I was really sad. And this, so whenever I see mod something equals one, it makes me think about that poor person left over <laughs> when it doesn't divide into it. And, it's worse than that because we then had another excursion and you had to divide into pairs. And I just, I just was so sure it wasn't going to happen. So straight away I ran up to one guy and said, let's be together. And he said, oh, I already promised someone, my imaginary friend, <laughs> that I'd be with him. Sorry. And I turned around and it was too late. Everyone else, and I was so desperate that this time I wasn't going to be left alone and I was alone again. Now, <laughs> it's crazy because the number of people in the class, X, Mod 3 was congruent to 1. And the number of people in the class X mod 3 mod 2 was also congruent to 1. And it turns out the Chinese knew this ages ago that there's all these unpleasant consequences that flow from this too because that also means that X mod 3 times 2, X mod 6 will also be congruent to 1. So yeah, what's the bet that the teacher's next plan was to have an excursion with six people groups in it? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, so that made me think of that. It's very sad. <laughs> I'm going to put that up so I don't have to see it and it's okay. <laughs> uh, now, um, so I wanted to uh, tell you, first of all, a little bit of maths. The first thing I'm going to talk about is exponentiation. Do you, shh, 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 does everyone remember that x to the a, if I square that, What's that the same as? X to the 2a. Does everyone remember that? Is that just burned into your brain? All right. Well, we're going to use that. Because you've got this problem facing you now that you're trying to communicate with each other and not let the tutors understand. And we talked about that a bit on, um, in the last lecture on Tuesday. And we talked about the, the interesting asymmetry that we have to create here, that somehow uh, there's a couple of asymmetries we want. We want it to be easy for you to encode messages and send them to each other, but we want that to be hard, or presumably, I say we, I mean you, I don't want you to do this. I hope you don't do any encryption at all, and that my Dracula can hunt you down and kill you all. <laughs> but I live in fear that, yeah. Oh, no, it's just a, oh. um, can't we just have like a one-time cipher sort of thing where it, before each round we just Sure. Yeah, do whatever you want. Don't tell me. <laughs> Don't tell me. Do whatever you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just somehow want this asymmetry that it's got to be hard, easy for you and hard for me. And asymmetries are hard to create. They're, they're, you can make them physically, can't you? I can make it so it's easy for me to get into a room and hard for you to get into a room with a physical device. What physical device do I have? A lock and I have a key. And I use friction, and that's sort of the basis of everything here. And that, I'm setting up a system that it's easy for me to get in and hard for you to get out. And I can make a fish trap that it's easy for the fish to get in and hard for the fish to get out. You know how fish traps work. Does everyone know how a fish trap works? Oh, very easy. I don't know if you... Uh, it's got a thing like this. Put a bit of cheese there. <laughs> no, that's not it. A fish trap looks like this. You get a big cage. Well, I say cage, but it's a... Um, a circular prism, and it's made out of like fencing wire or something like that. And then you make a sort of like a little funnel, also out of fencing wire, like that. 
This is probably illegal, so you probably can't do it. But, uh, and then the stream flows through here, and the fish get funneled into this area here. And it's easy for them to get in this end, but um, once they're in here, it's hard for them to get out because they've got to get through this tiny little hole. And there's this asymmetry here that it's easy to get in and hard to get out, again, relying on physical things. But how can we do that electronically? How can I somehow have a message that's easy for some people to understand and hard for others to understand? Well, at the heart of the whole thing, yeah. Asymmetric keys. Yeah, we, well, not asymmetric key. That's one solution. But just in general, we're going to exploit some asymmetry in maths, in information. We're going to have to come up with some things because anything you can do, I can do on my computer. So it can't be what we can do. It's got to be, we've got to get the asymmetry from somewhere else. We don't have asymmetric powers. So we're going to use asymmetric functions and asymmetric knowledge. So we saw one asymmetric problem the other day. Do you remember what that was? Something in maths that's easy to go one way, hard to go the other? What was that? Shh, shh, shh. Someone say it? I heard someone say Yeah, multiplying and factoring. That's right. It's easy to calculate if the factors, if um, n equals p times q, given these two, it's easy to work that one out. But given this, it's hard to find these guys. And if p and q are prime, then they're the only guys. This is much more work than that. All the time, mathematicians are coming up with new and faster ways of going this way. But still, all the ways they've got of going this way are fairly crap. Uh, and all the way, a, high, a primary school kid can go this way faster than the smartest mathematician with the smartest supercomputer can go that way if P and Q are big enough, you know, at the limit, once you make P and Q big enough. The, human, the algorithm is just trivial going the other way. So we're going to use that. Uh, uh, that's one of the symmetries we're going to exploit, asymmetries we're going to exploit. The other one is this. It's called the discrete log problem. That's the factoring problem. The discrete log problem goes something like this. A to the B equals C mod something. Let's say mod n. If you know everything here, except you don't know c, it's easy to work c out. And in fact, we saw an algorithm to do that. Remember that? We did the fast exponentiation algorithm the other day. But if you know everything but you don't know b, it's very hard to work out. a raised to some power mod n is c. What power is it? Well, you could try all possible ends. You could brute force it, and eventually you'll find it. Well, but you know, that's the order of magnitude of how smart we've got with this. We, we don't know really super fast ways of going back. We can go one way really fast, so the other way is really slow. That's called the discrete log problem. OK, well, we're going to use that today. And we're going to um, uh, introduce a brilliant encryption algorithm called RSA, which is, uh, I just love it because it's so cool. And it's one of the few algorithms you guys could program yourselves and probably get it right. You know, normal with cryptogra cryptographic algorithms, you just got to get a few little fiddly things right about it. It's a bit fussy and fiddly, and you're bound to make a little mistake. But with RSA, it's pretty hard to make a mistake. It's so simple, yet it's so brilliant and so hard to crack. Um, so first of all, um, let me show you a little bit of maths. If we've got x mod a equals 1, and we've also got x mod b equals 1, uh, a mistake a lot of um, high school students and early mathematicians fall into th is thinking that that means that x mod ab equals 1. Because it seems to work for all small values of a and b. Uh, and in fact, for a long time, people uh, conjectured that it was always the case. But um, it's easy enough to find counterexamples. All right. Uh, now, there's a famous. Uh, uh, oh, hang on. <laughs> oh. Okay, well, look, we're going to say uh, on this side, I made the claim, claim number one, that um, x mod a equals 1 and x mod b equals 1 implies that x mod a times b equals 1. And on this side, I've made the claim, claim 2, that this does not imply that x mod a b is equal to 1. Now, um, what do you guys reckon? Can both of those claims be true? 
It's certainly true for this case, isn't it? As I discovered to my horror. Can they, can they both be true? Can we have C1 and C2? Is there a problem with holding both of those points of view simultaneously? Yeah, I mean, uh, hmm, it's hard, isn't it? Maybe I'll just hide one of the boards. Which board would you like me to hide? Hide this one. <laughs> I'll write it all on the whiteboard. What do you think is the case? Which one's true, C1 or C2? C1. Why? Now we've got this problem that I've made some claims. In a lecture, often we make claims. Up until now, every claim I've made in a lecture has been true. I've never said a single untrue thing. But uh, I'm faced with a dilemma now that I seem to have made two claims in this lecture, one saying two things imply another and one saying two things don't imply another, which superficially appear contradictory claims. How could we resolve that? Prove it, Prove it? yeah. Or we could look at which has the neatest writing, which is argued most persuasively. What if this was claimed by an eminent person and this was claimed by a high school student? Uh, this is on Wikipedia, <laughs> and this is uh, on Wolfram. How can we resolve these two things? It's quite difficult. I think um, in science, we're probably going to go for a proof. We're going to probably try and prove one of them wrong. Can anyone come up with a proof? How do we know which one's right and which one's wrong? Maybe they're both right. I'd quite like them both to be right, because then I'd have a perfect track record. <laughs> If they were both right, then we would say that this domain that we're in at the moment is inconsistent. Hmm. Okay, so uh, let's hope that our academic domain is not inconsistent and only one of those two is right. So how are we going to prove it? A mod B equals 1, da, 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 da. well, this is actually called the Chinese remainder theorem, by the way. Oh, well, it's a consequence of the Chinese remainder theorem. Um, what about this? How big could my class have been? Could have been 31, couldn't it? What other sides could my class have been? My class could have been 7. Oh, yeah, it's still right. Couldn't be, uh, oh yeah, it could be 1. Yeah. Could have been 13. Well, look, they're all one more than the multiple of six, aren't they? Is that how you're generating them? <laughs> uh, well, what about this? What about if we say, let's think about what mod means. Mod means if we take x and divide it by a, it's got remainder one. So a remainder one is very hard. My brain's not good at thinking about that. Let's look at remainder zero, because I'm good at thinking about remainder zero. Uh, that's when everyone is happy in my world. So let's say. Uh, that means what? x minus 1 is divisible by what? By, by, in the case over here, if we're really concrete, it's divisible by 3. And over there, x minus 1 was divisible by 2. So I've got some number that's divisible by 3 and 2. Well, if a number's divisible by 3 and 2, you know from the fundamental theorem, the prime factorization theorem, if it's divisible by 3 and 2, what else must it be divisible by? It must be divisible by 6. So we know that x minus 1 is divisible by 6. So what does that tell us about x? Yeah. And can you see we could just generalize that and make that a and b? So if x minus 1 is divisible by a and x minus 1 is divisible by b, then x minus 1 has to be divisible by a and b simultaneously, has to be divisible by a, b. Is that true? Well. This step's a bit of a harder step to do. This will work if these guys are co-prime. For example, you can't say x minus 1 is divisible by 4, <laughs> and x minus 1 is divisible by 4, hence x minus 1 is divisible by 16. <laughs> What's that? For a not equals b? Yeah, but then you can't say x minus 1 is divisible by 4, x minus 1 is divisible by 2, so x minus 1 is divisible by 8. That's not the case. Four, yeah. What you've got to say is they've got to be co-prime. They can't have any factors in common. No, there's something like that. For certainly for primes, it's true. Let's just relax and say it's for primes, it's true. We'll have to study it a little bit more closely to work out exactly the conditions. So I don't know which of these two do we end up agreeing with. 
maybe I'll leave that for you to think about. So we certainly know that x, min, x mod a is 1, x mod b is 1, implies that x mod ab is 1 if a and b both prime. That's certainly the case. Is everyone cool with that? All right. So I wanted to show you, we're going to use that result in sex. So somehow we have to memorize that. Let's call that result that I've just created here, let's call that claim three. Now, here's how my crypto system is going to work. I'm going to exploit the one wayness of discrete log. I'm going to exploit the fact it's easy to raise something to a power mod something, but it's hard to go back the other way. So my message is going to be a number, and I'm going to call it M. And you, you can see how messages can be numbered. To other people in the old days, this was a weird idea, but to us, it's natural. What's a message? It's just a string of ASCII characters when we write it, which is a string of bits which is just an enormous number. If it's got 1,000 bits in it, it's, we know it's a 1,000 bit number. It's the same thing. So messages can be thought of as numbers. If your message is too big, because this is only going to work for numbers up to a certain size, then just break it into chunks. And we'll treat each chunk, we'll, we'll apply this algorithm to each chunk. How we then combine the chunks together is called the, the block mode of the cipher. And uh, that's, we, let's not worry about that now. Let's just look at the basics of how to encrypt a chunk. So you've got some number. And you want to encrypt it. Maybe this is a thousand bit long. So you've got a thousand bit message you want to encrypt. Here's how I'm going to do it. It's very, very simple. I'm just going to raise it to some power. I'm going to like raise it to one, two, five, seven. Uh, and then I'm going to mod it by my uh, n. I'm going to mod it by a big number that has to be at least a bit bigger than m to fit m into it. And that's how many bits I'm going to encode every message as a, a size n number. So I'm going to mod it by n. And I'm going to generate n in a special way. My n is going to be just two primes multiplied together, p times q. And we looked at that the other day, didn't we? Knowing n, it's hard to find p and q. But knowing p and q, it's easy to work out n. So we're going to pick two primes that are reasonably big, multiply them together, and that's going to give us n. I'm going to calculate our message by raising it to a power and modding it by n. Hey, the guy's talking. Who's talking? Shh, 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 shh. I'm not going to be able to explain. It's very complicated. It's already my brain's overheating. And you're like friction in my brain, just talking, 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 talking. Talk when I'm doing something really easy, like um, <laughs> I find everything a little bit hard. But please don't talk now, because I'm trying to do maths on the board. And there's something about blackboards that uh, keep whispering, make a mistake, make a mistake. What's that? I hate whiteboards. I can't stand whiteboards. I don't know why people have whiteboards. You cannot read a thing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mystery to me. Yes? Yeah, uh, now n is larger than n. N is, n is going to be the biggest number I can encode, and m is some message in that range of 0 to That's right. Yeah, we've got this um, problem going on here. So I'm going to just take a message, raise it to a power and mod it. And you guys can probably imagine that yourself. If I took some enormous number here, blah, 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 and raised it to some enormous power, and modded it by some other enormous number, I'm going to get some enormous number, and just looking at it, we're going to have no clue at all about how to go backwards. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my message, I'm going to encode it by raising it to this power, and modding it by n, and then I'm going to send it. And that's going to give me some value. m mod this whole thing here. After I've raised it to the power, it's going to give me something. Oh, maybe it gives me 42. That's my message. So I'm going to transmit the message across the ether. I'm going to say, my message is 42. Oh, and shh, shh, by the way, by the way, I used n equals whatever it was, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 7, 7, 3. Is that all right? <laughs> it's probably divisible by 3 or something stupid like that. But uh, OK, so I'm going to tell everyone n. I'm going to tell everyone the answer is 42. Is it 2? I'm only going to say, PS, I raised m to the 1, 2, 5, 7. Whew. So what am I telling everyone? I'm telling everyone, it's actually not discrete log anymore. I'm telling everyone the power I raise it to. And I'm telling everyone what I'm modding it by. 
And I'm telling everyone what the answer is. Shh, 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 shh. The only thing I'm not telling them is the original message. Now, it's very easy for me to do this calc, but given all these bits of information, it's very hard for them to work out what M is. Does that make sense? So here's how we can work out what M is. I'm going to encode a message by raising it to a power. And this is how I hope you're going to encode messages in the hunt. You're just going to get a message that you want to send to each other. Maybe it's a 20-bit message. So imagine that's a 20-bit number. You're just going to raise it to some power and mod it by something and send it to each other. And every one of you is going to know what you're modding it by, though uh, maybe no one will know any more than that. And I'm going to look at it, and I'm not going to be able to decode it. So all you're going to have to do is raise it to a power and mod it, and I'm doomed. I can't go backwards. This is what we call a one-way function. One-way functions are really important for cryptography, but if you think about it, they're also hopeless for cryptography, because um, the famous example by Bruce Schneier is his idea of a perfect one-way function is you write the message on a plate. You put the plate in a sack. You jump on the sack. Now the plate is completely scrambled. You send that message to the recipient. <laughs> the bad guys intercept it. They pour all the porcelain out. They cannot reassemble the message. Can you see breaking a plate is a one-way function? This is entropy again. Easy to do, hard to undo. No one can crack the code. <laughs> but what's the downside of the cipher? <laughs> the recipient <laughs> has a problem that they also can't crack the cipher. So we want our function to be one way, sort of. But we'd like it to let us undo it somehow, have a trapdoor in it. We call that a trapdoor one-way function. So you're going to decode the message. I'm going to send you 42. You're going to decode it by raising it to some other power. Maybe it's 56. Maybe that's the magic number that decodes it. These two are going to be a pair. Raising it to this power encodes it. Raising it to this power decodes it. And that's how RSA works. RSA is just a series of these little pairs like this. And, and everyone knows the value n, but no one knows what p and q are. And I've got one number in the pair, and you've got one number in the pair. And I encode the message by raising it to my number, and I send it through outer space to you. You decode it by raising it to your power. Anyone that intercepts it, they have no way of decoding it other than trying all possible powers until they accidentally stumble across your one. Let's see that that can work. Let's pick, um, let's suppose we're working mod, um, mod 12. Let's work on clock arithmetic. Um, so we've got uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Uh, I'm going to take a message and raise it to a power mod 12. Uh, let me think. Um, my message is going to be some number. I'm going to... Oh, I... Shh, 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 shh. I'm trying to work out quickly in my head how to do it. Ah, oh, oh, yeah, I got it. Oh, oh, it's not such a good example with uh, base, uh, base 12. OK. I've got a message. Maybe my message is 3. Now, I want to raise it to some power called x. And then I want you to be able to raise that, what you get, to some power called y. And at the end, I want you to get 3 back. Does that make sense? So in other words, Well, 3 to the x to the y, what's that the same as? That's the same as 3xy. I want 3xy to be the same as 3. Y is 1 on x, yes, y is 1 on x. But what does 1 on x mean in clock arithmetic? One more thing. OK, what if we had a bigger base? What if we had um, uh, someone pick another base that's bigger? No, th I just did 12. Bigger than 12. What's that? Let's make n two primes. Yeah, yeah, OK. Maybe my primes are 3 and 5. So I'm going to be doing everything base 15. Can you think of two numbers? Well, um, uh, mm, 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 mm. actually, let's not play this game for a second. Let's just take um, a very quick break while I talk about pair programming for a second. Just take a quick break from this for a sec while we talk about pair programming. In your project, 
we're getting you to do something interesting that I, I suspect you haven't done before, unless you're a professional programmer, which is write your programs as a pair. And by that, we're not saying what we, I'll tell you what we're hoping you'll do. You can do whatever you want. We're hoping you'll engage in a practice that is often followed in industry called pair programming. How pair programming works is not two people, two computers, using interfaces and clever coordination to work in repositories and things, working out how to synchronize. Pair programmers is two people programming with one computer. So for example, your lab this week, we want you to do one of the exercises, a pair programming exercise, where you do it with your pair. So one of you, shh, 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 the, like the cool funky programming houses do that these days. One sits down programming and the other guy stands over his shoulder or sits next to him, goes, hey, oh, well, that looks cool, okay, good. Yeah, yeah, what are you gonna do next? Yeah, that sounds good. And you're talking the whole time. And you're saying, I'm just gonna write this and I guess now we need to do that. And the guy looking over your shoulder is going, don't forget, you have to close that bracket there like you guys always call out to me and things like that. We're doing <laughs> massive simulated pair programming when I'm programming on the screen. This is actually amazing. It's quite threatening the first time you do it because programming is normally a very solitary art that you just do sort of by yourself, making your own decisions, having a little internal mental dialogue, and you're very sort of proud and precious about how you do it. With pair programming, um, I spoke to someone who was a lead in a team, actually, a programming team, and they'd just switched to um, pair programming. And he said some of the programmers just couldn't hack it and they had to leave the team eventually because they just couldn't work with someone else. But the ones that it worked for, it was just amazing. He said he, had a, he was working with another member and he himself found it quite intimidating. Oh, hi. Hi. Oh, do you think I could do that? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, we have an announcement, Kai. That's fantastic. <laughs> well done. Let's give him a big round of applause. That's fantastic. <laughs> well done. You. You're welcome. Do you want to go outside? <laughs> I think you should go. I think you should go outside. He can stay. He can I'll stay. stay later, the rest of my life. <laughs> Is there anyone else that would like to get married now? <laughs> <laughs> Girls, don't go. Don't go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, um, look, this reminds me of, um, this reminds me of uh, an interesting thing that used to happen to me in the old days. I was, um, used to go away on youth camps and there was a big group of us, guys and girls who were friends. And uh, we were just a big gang all hanging around together, the guys and the girls, and everything was quite innocent. And, and we, and we all sort of had crushes on each other and all that sort of stuff. And we used to play this game on the camp uh, called Spoons. Has anyone played Spoons? <laughs> it's, it sounds bad. It's actually completely innocent. It's this game where you sit, sh sh you sit around the table and you've got like uh, a cards and everyone has to put cards down. You pass cards on. When you get a pair, you put them down. Has anyone played this game? And there's, if there's N people around the table, well, no, there's N plus one people around the table, there's N spoons in the middle. And what happens is this. You keep playing, playing, and no one's allowed to pick up a spoon until you get rid of all your cards. But as soon as you've managed to throw all your cards down, you can pick up a spoon. You can only pick up a spoon if you've got rid of all your cards or if you notice that someone else has already picked up a spoon. So what happens is the game goes and then someone surreptitiously gets a spoon because they're out and everyone's going so frantically trying to get out that no one, and then someone else notices and, and you're still playing and playing and then suddenly there's this mad problem. Everyone, and, uh, of course, what do you think happens to me? <laughs> and, uh, and we used to play this game all the time and then suddenly I noticed that the people had started to pair up. And some of them even got married. And it freaked me out completely. Because I suddenly thought, oh no, there's only a few girls left. 
And I counted, and there was one more girl than boys. And I thought, oh no, that's terrible. It's like spoons. So if you guys are the first to get married in your big extended group, I bet everyone else is going to get married really quickly. Because I now go, he's not available anymore. <laughs> There's only two decent guys left. <laughs> oh! <laughs> you know, and yeah, so it's going to happen really quick. You're just like cracking the ice. And it's going to, but congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marriage is a fantastic thing. It's really nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so the idea with pair programming um, is that you're working together as a team. And somehow your heads are put together. And it's sort of like two heads are better than one. It turns out that two people working as a team is more than twice as productive as two people working individually. So this is why it's sweeping as a software thing. Now you have to, you have to throw away a lot of things you're really precious about. Like if you really like in code this way and they really like code that way, and you keep swapping who's coding, who's not. If you really like laying it out this way and they really like sending it out that way, it's really annoying because you take over their code and you instantly start rearranging it to be like you like and then they take it over and they start changing it. And that's really annoying. It's like one of you like squeezing the toothpaste in the middle and one at the end and you just can't keep having that fight. Eventually you just got to relax about it. So you, start, you stop being precious about a whole lot of things and you just start focusing on what's really important. Now the guy that I knew that did this was a really serious programmer. He's an awesome guy. In fact, he's so awesome, he's a hang glider. He works for three months of the year. No, for three months of the year he works. He earns enough money consulting in those three months. He then takes the next nine months off every year and he goes around the world hang gliding. <laughs> then he comes back and works for another three. He's just the most awesome programmer. And he said he even, he was the best programmer in the universe. He even found it very confronting to have someone pair programming with him because someone's watching you make your mistakes. And at first you're really defensive, but after a while you realize you're both working towards the same goal. And it's fantastic. Someone's sort of second guessing you, or when you're stressed with some little part, they're looking at another part. And working as a team, the code turns out to be fantastic. Now, as we said, some people just couldn't do it and had to leave his team. Uh, eventually, the old crusty people it can only do it by themselves. But for those that it works for, it's an amazing experience. So we're not compelling you to do it, but we've set up the assignment to allow you to do it. So I strongly suggest you give it a try with your partner. We're going to keep experimenting with this next year in 2911. With your partner now, try and do everything you can together with just one terminal, one watching, one typing, and then keep swapping. You just focus on the important things. You don't focus on the fiddly details anymore. And the coding is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Uh, it reminds me of a story that I once heard someone say. I'll tell you this story another day, actually, because I want to get back to RSA. So, you know the mechanics of how RSA works. The only thing I haven't told you is how to pick these two magic numbers. RSA is going to work like this. You're going to agree on an N. One of you to send a message is going to raise it to some power, and the other one to decode it is going to raise whatever they send you to some other power. And miraculously, you're going to get the original message back. That's the entire mechanics of it. So you can see how easy it is to program. The only tricky bit is picking those two numbers so that one exactly undoes the other. If it was easy to pick those two numbers, then the crypto system would be hopeless, because the guys eavesdropping the message would be able to work out the number that goes with your number to decode it. So there's got to be some way of calculating these two numbers that you can do yourselves that the bad guy can't do. And here's how we do it. We have one piece of information the bad guy doesn't have, which is we know the P and Q that we use to generate the N. Because we know the P and Q, we can calculate P minus 1, Q minus 1. Now this value, P minus 1 times Q minus 1, is some number, obviously slightly smaller than N, that if you just know N, you can't work this number out unless you know how to factorize it. And factorizing it is just going to take too long. So we know this number, and hence we also know this number, because we worked out P and Q. The bad guys are going to know this number, because everyone in the world is going to know what N we use, but they're never going to be able to work out this number. And this is our magic helper number. How it works is this. This number here, let's say what it, let's just pick a number to make it concrete. What, what, what should we call that? Suppose that was um, 1001. So, well, no, actually, let's pick a real P and a real Q. What's a real prime number that's like uh, two digits long? 13. What's another one that's two digits long? What's that? 42? <laughs> 37? What's 13? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> is, is 337 prime as well? I, I will give a Mars bar to the universe if 337 is prime. <laughs> what about 133? Oh my god, that's fantastic. Wow. That's amazing. 
And if you turn it upside down, it says boobless. <laughs> Did you used to do that with your calculators? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very funny. <laughs> Okay, so what is 13 times 36? Now let's just, who the heck cares? Let's say, no, no, we should do it properly. Um, what is 13 times 37? Someone with a calculator. Or year two maths. That's smart. Oh, oh I should put it up here, shouldn't I? On your marks, get set. Uh, oh, three times seven is 21. Carry two. Uh, nine plus one is 11. Uh, uh, four, 81. Ah. I almost raced you, didn't I? If time ran backwards, I'd have been first. <laughs> so we'll say that n is 481. So this number up here, what's that going to be? 12 times 36. Ooh. That's going to be an easy one, isn't it? What's 12 times 36? 432. Is it 432? Okay. Okay, so 432. So everyone in the world's going to know 281, but we're the only ones that can work out 432. And here's what we're going to do. You pick your encryption value. I don't really care what it is. There's some constraints on how you pick it. But just suppose you pick the encryption value of, you're going to raise it to the power of 3. What's the magic number that's going to undo it? Well, the story is, it's the inverse of 3 mod 432. So what number times 3 is 1 in 430? That's what inverse means. Yeah, right? The inverse of 3 is a third, because you say, what number times 3 gives me 1. Well, it's a third. So that's the inverse in normal arithmetic. Well, in clock arithmetic, it's exactly the same. What's the inverse of 3? It's answering the question, what number times 3 is going to give me 1? So 3 times x equals 1 mod 432. Now, not all numbers have inverses. Let's hope 3 does in this case. Does anyone want to have a go at working that out? What's that? Uh, yeah, but I'll put, I'll put them, I'll, everything's mod 432, I should just put that in brackets. 3 times, oh, now I've rubbed it out, x. Yeah. Can anyone see, work it out just by brute forcing? Is it small, is anyone trying to brute force it? Put up your hands if you're trying to, put up your hands if you're not trying to brute force it. I see. <laughs> I see. Is anyone actually trying to brute force it? Has anyone written a program? No one, no one. Uh. All right. Let's suppose it's 7. No, let's suppose it's 100. 100, uh, 100 it's going to be more than 100. 100 and uh, 200, 215. Let's suppose it's 215. I'm making that up. But suppose 3 times 215, if we model it by that, was 1. Then, if that were the case, those guys are talking. It's not the same people. As you. You're only allowed to talk if you're proposing. <laughs> are you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I won't embarrass everyone by saying that Ian and Simon are now engaged. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so, uh, uh, yeah, so this is how we work it out. If, if one of them is 3, one of the magic numbers is 3, then the other one's going to be 215, suppose, because 3 times 215 is 1 mod this. So lo and behold, everything will work out miraculously if we pick the two numbers that way and everything will be perfect and RSA will work and we'll be able to encode and decode. And you can work out the inverse. There's a simple algorithm to work it out. It just uses the uh, GCD algorithm. You know the GCD algorithm? Has everyone done finite maths? Discrete maths? Wave at me if you've done discrete maths or doing it now. Okay, cool. Have you done uh, the uh, GCD algorithm? Have you done the inverse algorithm? Way of modifying that to get the inverse? Yeah, cool, cool. Okay, so have you already seen RSA? Oh, yes. Why didn't you say that first? Yeah. So you have seen RSA? Forgotten, Forgotten it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, oh, last semester. All right, well, we'll knock over RSA over in a second because we've only got a second more to go and then we're there. So here's, shh, 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 shh. here's why it works. Yes, do you understand what you have to do? You just have to find the inverse mod this number Calculate p minus 1, q minus 1, pick one ever, whatever number you want to raise it to the power of, find the inverse mod that, that'll give you the other number, and now you have a crypto system that we tutors cannot break, as long as your numbers are big enough. We can always break it by brute forcing, pick the numbers big enough so we can't brute force it. How can you do calculations with big numbers like that? You need to have some sort of big number ADT, and you'd need to have written some sort of modular exponentiation function. Yeah, yeah. Which, coincidentally, are the lab exercises. So if you do those, 
you can actually uh, come up with an unbreakable encryption, better than any encryption system and simpler that you will have devised already. So why does it work? Well, here's why it works. It's very simple. I want to show essentially that if I've got the message and I raise it to the encryption key and then I raise it to the decryption key, what do I want to get back at the end? I want that to be equal to M. Okay, well, what is this really equal to? It's equal to, this is, uh, I would like, uh, that's what I'd like. And here's what I know. M to the E to the D is the same as M E D. Is everyone happy with that? And what's D? D is a decryption key. So if we pick an encryption of key of E, the decryption key was its inverse, wasn't it? Do you remember what the inverse is? The inverse is something such that E times D equals 1 mod P minus 1, Q minus 1. What does it mean to be 1 mod P minus 1, Q minus 1? It simply means that ED equals some multiple of P minus 1, Q minus 1. I know to my sorrow, plus 1. That's very sad. So does that make sense? That's what it means. If you mod both sides by this yucky chunk, this whole thing disappears. It's just a multiple of that. So that's got no remainder, and you end up with the remainder of 1. So this is what ED means. So really, I'm calculating here M to the k p minus 1, q minus 1, plus 1. Well, what does a plus 1 mean up the top? I can simplify that straight away. What is that? m times k p minus 1, q minus 1, times m to the 1. So I would really like this whole expression here to be the original message, and what do I have at the very end? I have the original message. So that tells me what do I really, really more than anything hope that this is? One. I hope that's just going to turn into one. And then my original, I'm going to get my original message back at the end. Well, is that equal to one? Let's inspect it with our oh, eyes. We're going to use Fermat's little theorem. Now, I gave you Fermat's little theorem yesterday. Did I, did I remember to give you the proof of it? No, it's a, it's a brilliant proof. In fact, there's lots of good proofs you can look up on the internet uh, of Fermat's little theorem. You should look them up. There's a million different ways of proving it. My favorite, the way I was taught it was by using Lagrange's theorem, which I find very beautiful, a combinatorial result. But there's ways you could explain it to a high school kid that don't need to know Lagrange's theorem. There's hundreds of proofs of it. They're really good. But talking about any one of them would just take up too much time. We haven't got enough time now. So I'm going to skip that. And we're instead just going to assume that Fermat's little theorem is true. So we want to show that this is equal to 1. Well, let's think. Let's just do a bit of clever rearranging. What is m to the k p minus 1, q minus 1? I want to, oh, this was all mod n. What is that? Not mod n. What is that mod p? One. Well, it could be 1. Let's convince ourselves it is. That's the same as m p minus 1, m to the p minus 1 all to the power of, what, k, q minus 1, mod p. Now what's m to the p minus 1 mod p? What? 1, because of Fermat's little theorem. So that's equal 1 to some power, which is 1. So mod p, it's 1, woohoo! And similarly, I could rearrange it, and we could see mod q, it was 1. By, again, Fermat's little theorem. So I know it's 1 mod p, and I know it's 1 mod q. But I actually have to show it's mod 1 mod pq. But do you think it is? If it's 1 mod p and 1 mod q, do you reckon it is 1 mod pq? If, well, p and q are both primes. That's how I picked them. So it is. By why? How, how did you know that? Well, we'll leave that as an exercise to work out. <laughs> OK, so can everyone see? If m to the p, uh, this whole expression here is 1 mod p, and this whole expression here is 1 mod q, then we have shown, or as an exercise for you to show, that this whole thing is 1 mod pq, which means this whole thing is 1, which means m to the ed gives us m back originally, which means you get your message, you raise it to a power, the recipient raises it to the other power, and you get the original message back. It's miraculous, and no one in the middle can do anything about it. Yes? Is there some sort of method by which you could send 
a message completely unencrypted, but if it gets intercepted by anyone other than the desired recipient, it would become encrypted? Oh, is there some way you can send a message that's unencrypted while you send it, but if anyone intercepts it, it becomes encrypted? Um, I, well, it's not relying on information properties to do that. It'd be relying on physical properties. There's probably some quantum way of doing that. Is that what you're thinking? I mean, there's a whole lot of quantum cryptography based on the fact that someone intercepting a message changes the message. Um, but you'd, you have to, again, set up this asymmetry that your intended recipient can intercept the message and decode it, and the other one can't. Yeah, yeah. There's some beautiful quantum cryptography. Maybe we should talk about that one lecture, too. It's very beautiful. It actually works. It, the quantum cryptography was, it was another one of these brilliant examples where some guy, some brilliant cryptographer, I wonder if I can remember which one it was. Is it Needham or someone, or was it one of the RSA guys? RSA stands for Rivas, Shamir, and Edelman, the three guys that invented it, got their names into RSA. It was one really clever guy, anyway, oh, I wish I could remember who, said one day when he learned a tiny little bit of quantum theory, he says, oh, that's interesting. If light really does have these particle properties, these quantum properties, then you could just send photons of light over an optical fiber and do this really cool little trick, and no one could ever intercept the message. It would be physically impossible by the laws of quantum thermodynamics to actually ever understand or decode or intercept the message without revealing yourself, without satisfying some property. And the system is just guaranteed to be true by the rules of physics. It's not relying on some wishful thinking that you, it's really hard to factorize or something like that. Um, and most people, I think, when they have a brilliant thought like that, just have the brilliant thought and then go away. But what did he do? Yeah, he went and did it. <laughs> he said, so I guess this really obvious application of quantum theory to cryptography could be done. How interesting. And then he said, so I'll do it. And he actually built one. And they've got one in England now and it works. It's fantastic. And they think it's the way of the future. Soon, you know, governments everywhere will be talking to each other with photons over optical fibers, quantum encrypted. Uh, it essentially is a really clever strategy that means the line is uh, uneavesdroppable. If someone intercepts a message, you know about it. OK. Um, uh, so, I think that's all I wanted to say. I think we've finished. I just wanted to give you basically a quick taste of what Nuth would call the semi-numerical algorithms. Algorithms involving numbers. Numbers have all sorts of interesting complexity in them. We don't have to add much ourselves as computer scientists. We just need to notice it and exploit them with very simple algorithms. And we can get very complex and beautiful systems. We're going to take a break now. Then I'm going to have an extension lecture. It's completely optional. And I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm actually going to be talking about something to do with cryptography. I'm going to be talking about cryptographic protocols and uh, Stargate, SG-1. <laughs>